Imagine trying to invade a country without checking your combat vehicle storage to see if you have enough T-14 Armatas to actually pull it off. Sounds crazy, right? Well, that's exactly what Putin seems to have done in the Russian-Ukraine conflict. You've probably heard it before, but we're here to say it again. Russia is running out of tanks, and it's embarrassing. But wait, Russia's military is supposed to be a force not to be reckoned with. How did it come to this? Is Ukraine so skilled at getting rid of these tanks, or is the Russian army somehow failing at utilizing the ones they do have? Sorry, had. Let's find out. Here's where it all started and quickly went from bad to worse. For Russia, of course. In the little more than a year since Putin began his full-scale invasion of Ukraine and it hasn't quite gone as planned, Russian troops failed to take the capital Kyiv, facing extraordinary resistance from Ukrainians as Ukraine began to receive advanced military hardware and support from Western countries, Russian troops were pushed back into the east of the country, becoming stuck in a devastating war of attrition. In both the war's early stages and current state of gridlock, one of the most notable trends are the enormous losses of manpower and equipment suffered by the supposedly superior Russian armed forces. Nowhere are these devastating losses more obvious than Russia's supply of tanks. And trust us, if you're waging war, you don't want to run low on those. While recent years have seen a number of predictions about tanks becoming obsolete, the war in Ukraine has demonstrated that they remain critical to modern land combat, featuring heavily in operations by both sides. Putin has repeatedly thrown huge amounts of armor into the conflict, hoping to overwhelm Ukrainian defensive positions. As a consequence, a February report by the London-based International Institute for Strategic Studies found that the Russian military had lost at least half of all its entire pre-war fleet of tanks in the fighting, a figure which has only grown in the months since. In just a single day of combat during March around the key city of Bakhmut, Ukraine destroyed 21 tanks, 23 armored personnel vehicles and 8 artillery systems. And as of early April, experts estimate that Russian tank losses exceed 2,000 vehicles in 14 months, while Ukrainian officials put the figure even higher for reference. True, Ukraine has also taken heavy losses, with Russia recently claiming it has destroyed more than 8,300 of the country's tanks. However, Ukraine has been working to crowdsource reinforcement tanks from the West, while sanctions and international isolation have forced Russia to dig deep into its stockpiles from the days of the Soviet Union. That's pretty desperate. Unable to obtain the high-tech components it needs to build modern tanks like the T-14 Armata, Russia is now relying on hundreds of 60-year-old Soviet T-62s and 70-year-old T-55s. This is particularly embarrassing for Putin, who has flaunted his efforts to modernize Russia's military capabilities spending billions in an attempt to once more turn the country into a superpower. So how did this cringy story of Russia's armed forces losing tanks by the dozens begin? The losses started during Putin's initial attempts to seize Kyiv. As Russian tanks and troops poured into the country, General Colonel Oleksandr Shirsky, the head of Ukraine's ground forces, determined that the Russian columns would need to advance along two or three major highways to enter Kyiv in their blitzkrieg attack. So Sierski organized two rings of troops to defend the city, one in the outer suburbs and one in the capital, with as much space between them as possible, in order to minimize damage to infrastructure. He also moved Ukrainian artillery and mobile anti-tank units into concealed defensive positions to the north and northwest of Kyiv, allowing them to easily target the highways and saving them from Russian airstrikes. This strategy proved to be extremely effective, allowing defenders to destroy many of the slow-moving tanks. But it gets better. There have been reports of entire companies of Russian armor being destroyed in deadly ambushes by Ukrainian hit-and-run teams using anti-tank guided missiles or ATGMs. While relatively simple, ATGMs have proved to be an incredibly effective tool for destroying Russian armor. There are several main varieties of ATGM currently in use by Ukrainian troops. One is the domestically produced Stugna P, an older class of anti-tank weapon also known as the Skiff in its export version. The Stugna P's launcher and missile weigh a combined 60 pounds, making it a relatively large and heavy ATGM. It also relies on operator guidance, 
requiring its operator to keep tracking the target at all times while the missile is in flight. But even with these limitations, videos have flooded the internet of Ukrainians using Stugna-P missiles to devastating effect. The Stugna-P has a range from 328 feet to 3.1 miles, with a missile flight time of up to 25 seconds, depending on the target's range. It can also carry high-explosive anti-tank or high-explosive fragmentary warheads capable of penetrating modern tank armor. One benefit of the Stugna-P is that despite being heavy, it can be mounted on a tripod, covered with camouflage, and piloted remotely on a laptop-like unit from up to 164 feet away. This has allowed the Ukrainian troops operating Stugnas to keep their units safe from retaliation by Russian tanks and artillery. And the system is simple enough for inexperienced operators to quickly become skilled, such as 42-year-old Ukrainian MP-turned-soldier Tetiana Chornoval. Chornoval worked as a Stugna operator during the Battle of Kyiv, where she and others used a number of hidden ATGMs to throw Russian tank columns into chaos. As she described it in an interview, we saw tanks appearing and we literally ran to our position. I ran to my operator's case, I switch it on, and I see tanks on the screen. They just entered within the range of my missile. I took aim and destroyed the first tank. I shot it right at the fuel cells, and the ammunition was detonated. The tank literally flew off the road, and now it is somewhere in the road ditch in the forest. We don't know about you guys, but we're pretty impressed with Tatiana. With hundreds or thousands of stories like this, it isn't hard to see why even Ukraine's domestic ATGM system has proved to be bad news for Russia. Additionally, there are three main Western ATGM systems responsible for the bulk of destruction to Russian tanks. First is the American FMG-148 Javelin, jointly manufactured by defense giants Raytheon and Lockheed Martin. Ukraine has received more than 7,000 Javelins since the start of the invasion. One of the Javelin's biggest strengths is its trajectory, as its missile travels in a high arc in order to strike the less armored section of a tank at the top of its turret. Javelins can also penetrate even the toughest tank armor, as they are fitted with two warheads. A primary charge disrupts the anti-missile countermeasures or armor, while a second charge penetrates and detonates inside the tank. However, this also makes Javelins expensive at about $200,000 per unit and $78,000 per replacement missile. Cost aside, Javelins have become a staple of Ukraine's defense throughout the war so far even being turned into an inspirational internet meme termed Saint Javelin by Ukrainian-Canadian journalist Christian Boris. Even as the invasion shifted into its current brutal back and forth of artillery barrages and trench warfare, the Javelin has continued to prove invaluable to Ukrainian forces. But Javelins are just the beginning of our How Ukraine is Obliterating Russian Tanks investigation. Also critical has been the Next Generation Light Anti-Tank Weapon, or NLAW, designed and produced by the Swedish company Saab Befors Dynamics. The Enlor is shoulder-mounted, weighs only 28 pounds, has no backblast footprint, and has a firing range of 65 to over 1,950 feet. Like the Javelin, it utilizes fire-and-forget targeting, requiring no target guidance after firing. It also includes two fire modes. Overfly Top Attack, or OTA, where the missile uses magnetic sensors to detonate just above its target, and Direct Attack Mode. The NLAW is also extremely practical, as it uses a non-explosive soft charge when fired, meaning it can be safely launched from indoors or enclosed spaces. While less expensive than the Javelin, the NLAW still runs at a pricey $33,000 per shot, but with their larger arsenal of ATGMs, Ukrainians have also gotten very good at mixing and matching, using each system in the tactical environment and situations where it will be most useful. As Anatoly, a member of the 128th Mountain Assault Brigade, currently fighting near Bakhmut, recently told a reporter, I'm often asked which ATGW is the best, Enlaw or Javelin. I will say from experience that it is best to use them in tandem. Enlaw is excellent at close range, so it is indispensable when combat action takes place in urban areas like cities and villages, and the Javelin is best at a range of 1 to 2.5 kilometers, i.e. in the open field. Similarly, against lighter armored vehicles, Ukrainians will often now use the domestically produced Stugners or Corsars, saving Enlaws for strikes on heavy tanks from concealed, often urban, positions. 
That's another five starts for Ukraine's fierce weaponry. But we're not done yet. Lastly is the AT-4 anti-tank missile, also produced by Saab Bofors Dynamics, a disposable, recoilless ATGM. The AT-4 fires a single shot at a range of 650 to 1,950 feet. Designed during the Cold War, the AT-4 is also highly modular and can be loaded with a range of different warheads, some of which can penetrate tank armor up to 600 mm thick. Perhaps the AT-4's biggest advantage is its low cost. Each can be produced for under $1,500 and even less in Sweden. While there are numerous videos of Ukraine's armed forces using them to destroy multi-million dollar Russian tanks, since the invasion began, Ukrainians have also become more and more adept at using their arsenal of ATGMs, making it incredibly difficult for Russia to make any real headway. ATGMs, NLAWs, and AT4s, oh my. Yes, Putin has been served a number of reasons to reconsider his invasion plans, but Ukraine isn't done providing him with a few more. Here's a terrifying and reliable weapon they've added to the pile. Another critical but often overlooked means by which Ukraine has wreaked havoc on Russian armor is with the use of landmines. Some of these are from the Soviet era, but the US also supplied over 7,000 shells of its remote anti-armor mine system, or RAM, in late 2022. The RAM is a 155mm howitzer shell containing nine anti-tank mines. When the shell is fired over an open area, the tiny mines are scattered across the ground. This means that Ukrainian forces can lay the mines from a distance rather than by hand, without risking fire by Russian artillery. This makes them especially valuable in open spaces, where they can effectively stop an entire tank force. RAM's lethal power was on full display several months later, when Russian armed forces attempted to take the Ukrainian town of Vuladar. In mid-February 2023, Russian losses due to the mines were so steep that the British Defense Secretary claimed an entire 1,000-man Russian brigade was effectively annihilated in one day. Reports like this make it easy to see how tank losses have become so enormous. But besides Ukraine's growing supply and talent for using anti-tank weaponry, there is another driving factor behind Russia's loss of more than 2,000 tanks, which has to do with its deeply flawed strategic approach to the conflict. Specifically with the backbone of Russia's invasion force, the Battalion Tactical Group, or BTG, a combined unit of tanks, infantry, and artillery designed for lightning offensive operations. As Russian columns were devastated outside of Kyiv in early 2022, it became apparent that the BTG were not proving nearly as effective as they should have been. Most contained far too many tanks and armored vehicles, with too little infantry support. So when they came under attack by Ukraine's mobile strike teams, there were not enough soldiers to repel the ambush, and Russian tanks were easy targets. This was compounded by Russia's failure to establish air superiority, which meant it was unable to supply close air support for its tank columns, the way the US did in Iraq and Afghanistan. Combined with Russia's myriad issues resupplying its front lines or repairing broken-down vehicles, and you begin to see just how things went so badly so fast for Putin. And because of all the elements above, Russian tank losses have only grown heavier in the following months of the war. During Ukraine's autumn counteroffensive into the Kharkiv region, for instance, Russia was losing as many as 10 battle tanks per day to Ukraine's two, despite the fact that Russian troops were on the defensive. Most of the tanks destroyed were T-80s and T-72s, which began Russia's critical shortage of those systems. During that same period, Ukrainians reportedly captured over 560 vehicles and hundreds of extra ATGMs. Thus, in the grinding stalemate which has followed, Putin has had to rely on older and older equipment, most notably the T-55s and the T-62s. The T-55 is so old, it literally qualifies as antique. The tank's prototype was first completed in 1945 and entered service with the Soviet Army in 1958. But reports indicate that in March of 2023, Russian troops began moving hundreds of them out of the 111th Central Tank Reserve Base in Khabarovsk, where they had been sitting in long-term storage for many decades. A recent photo showing a Russian soldier posing next to a T-55 somewhere in Zaporizhia Oblast seems to confirm their presence on the ground in Ukraine. 
The photo also indicates that Russia is sending the T-55s to Ukraine without upgrading them, as the tank in the photo appears to have the same infrared optics that were being used in the late 1950s. Similarly, there is no evidence that the T-55s have been reinforced with modern explosive reactive armor and seem to be using the same thin steel body plating as they did during the early Cold War. This may prove to be an especially bad decision, since the T-55s also include the so-called jack-in-the-box floor, which has doomed many of Russia's other Soviet-era tanks. Unlike modern battle tanks such as the German Leopard 2 or US M1 Abrams, which keep their shells away from the crew behind thick armored walls, older Soviet tanks store their ammunition in a carousel-style automatic loader, sitting directly below the main turret and crew. With only thin steel armor, a well-placed enemy shot can ignite the ammunition and easily blow up the tank. As Professor Robert E. Hamilton of the US Army War College put it bluntly, for a Russian crew, if the ammo storage compartment is hit, everyone is dead. He adds that the force of the explosion will instantaneously vaporize anyone unlucky enough to be inside. And that's far from the ancient tank's only weakness. As military journalist David Axe has written, the T-55 is, from a generation of armored vehicles before modern optics, autoloaders, and multi-axis stabilization for their main guns, passive infrared optics, and sophisticated computerized fire controls. Essentially, all this makes the T-55 far less accurate and powerful than any other tank on the battlefield today, leaving them as easy targets for Ukrainian ATGMs and artillery. The Soviet T-62 isn't a whole lot better. It also suffers from poor armor and the jack-in-the-box floor, as well as limited range and firepower compared with any modern tank. First introduced in 1961, the T-62 was once considered cutting edge, even into the 1970s. Many are equipped with either a TSH-2B-41 or a TSH-SM-41U gunner's sight and active thermal sights, which allow a T-62 gunner to fire about a mile during the day and about half that at night. This is about half the range of most modern tanks, making the T-62 a sitting duck in many situations. In an effort to slightly improve their effective range, Russia has so far pulled more than 800 T-62s from long-term storage and fitted many with 1PN96MT02 analog thermal gunner's sights. These sights are an upgrade from the T-62's original design, but have not been state-of-the-art since the 1970s, and have mostly been long since replaced with digital Sonsa U sights. But since the Sansa U includes advanced French components now unavailable to Russia due to sanctions, they have had to make do with the older analog sites, making them essentially target practice for Ukrainians. Another huge issue with both the T-55 and T-62 is their discrepancy in barrel and ammunition size. Newer tanks such as the T-90, T-80 and even the T-64 being used by the Ukrainians have the same size barrel and can use common shells. By contrast, the barrel of the T-62 is 115mm and the T-55s is 100mm, meaning both that they cannot use modern ammunition and that they have issues destroying heavily armored targets. Making this worse is the T-55 and T-62's incredibly slow rate of fire, while the crew of a Ukrainian T-64, Leopard 2 or M1 Abrams can fire 10 to 12 rounds a minute a T-55 or T-62 crew is lucky if they can manage three or four. This reality is likely to get an even greater number of Russians killed in direct battles with Ukrainian forces as they become more and more outgunned. At the same time, Russian tank losses and reliance on older hardware has come hand in hand with catastrophic levels of casualties. The country is so far estimated to have lost some 200,000 to 250,000 soldiers. For reference, that is more than the US has lost in every one of its wars since World War II combined. In response, Putin has been forced to enact conscription, augmenting the Russian front lines with untrained conscripts, hardened criminals, and mercenaries. These troops are essentially forced to attack at gunpoint, and thousands have instead opted to mutiny, flee, or surrender to Ukraine once they reach the front lines. These mind-boggling numbers have also affected the Russian military's ability to properly resupply its tank personnel. 
Many of the 2,000 tanks already lost were destroyed with their crews still inside, leading to a serious shortage of soldiers with actual experience operating tanks, especially the more modern ones. Ukrainian analyst Oleksandr Kovalenko was recently tracking the shipment of more than a dozen restored T-72s, T-80s and T-90s to a Russian unit near Svatova in eastern Ukraine. But when they arrived, Kovalenko noticed that the most interesting thing is that there are no crews in the unit who can operate these tanks. Replacement crews for T-55s and T-62s can be trained in a relatively shorter time frame, as they do not need to be trained to use automatic gun loaders or sophisticated modern fire controls. The downside of this, of course, is that Russia now has extremely green soldiers, using what amounts to rusting, obsolete weaponry. Down the road, this will create even more issues, as the crews currently being trained will not be able to effectively operate the more modern tanks, even if Russia is able to start their production. This degradation of manpower and training could prove to be an even bigger issue than Russia's dwindling military supplies, as effective recruiting and training will become harder and harder. Long term, this could spell disaster for the Russian military and perhaps for Putin himself. With no way to replace modern tanks or the crews needed to operate them properly, it may prove impossible for Russia to remain a global or even regional power. The very presence of T-62s and T-55s on the battlefield is an indictment of Russian power and a sure sign that its armed forces are flailing. But what do you think? Will Russia's tank losses be a defining factor in the outcome of the war? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe for more content from military experts.